am thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy Center for this webinar on the 2022 Annual Report of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Congress established the commission some 22 years ago when the United States granted permanent normal trade relations status to the People's Republic of China. This led to China's eventual accession to the World Trade Organization and helped set the stage for China's remarkable economic growth over the past two decades. During this period, the commission has performed a vital reality check function as the two economies have become more entwined. Its legislative mandate is to monitor, investigate, and report to Congress on the national security implications of the bilateral trade and economic relationship between the US and the PRC. In other words, the Commission looks at the U.S.-China economic and trade relationship through a national security lens. Each year, the Commission and its staff conduct public hearings and engage in research on cutting-edge topics, all culminating in an annual report to Congress. All 12 members of the Commission, six Democrats and six Republicans, are appointed by the four congressional leaders. As someone who served on the commission for more than a decade, I can say with perhaps some authority that it is one of the few organizations in Washington that has regularly and routinely functioned on a bipartisan basis. Each year, the commission's information-rich reports, along with its recommendations, are adopted or often adopted on a unanimous basis, and that includes the 2022 report uh, which you can find on the Commission's website at www.usc.gov, uscc.gov. Let me add uh, that the Commission has been way ahead of the curve in identifying key areas of concern in the U.S.-China relationship that are now widely recognized by members of both political parties. Uh, today, we are delighted to be joined by two longtime Commission members, Carolyn Bartholomew and Robin Cleveland. Carolyn Bartholomew is currently the chairman of the board of Radio Free Asia and serves on the board of the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. Earlier in her career, she worked at senior levels in the US Congress and served as a longtime counsel, legislative director and chief of staff to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Carolyn has deep expertise in US-China relations, including issues related to trade, human rights, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And in 2021, while serving as the chair of the commission, she was one of seven US citizens sanctioned by the Chinese government. Robin Cleveland has also enjoyed a distinguished career on Capitol Hill, having served in a number of important positions with Senator Mitch McConnell, including on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and as clerk of the Foreign Operations Subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee. During the administration of President George W. Bush, Robin was the Associate Director for National Security and International Affairs in the Office of Management and Budget. She has also served as counselor to the President of the World Bank, where she had a broad policy budget and fundraising portfolio, including debt relief programs in Africa. 
Uh, Carolyn, uh, Robin, I want to thank you both uh, for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, before I turn it over to you to summarize the Commission's report, let, we, let me remind our audience that they should feel free to add a comment or question in the chat if watching live on YouTube or tweet at BPC underscore bipartisan or using hashtag BPC live. So with that, uh, Robin, let me just why don't you start us off with a, an overview of the commission's economic relation, uh, economic recommendations. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for having us both. And uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about the report and very much appreciated your service on the commission. Um, so I'll focus on the economics and turn to Carolyn for security and foreign affairs. Um, the commission uh, noted that whether the, their support for Russia's war against Ukraine, its zero COVID policy, or the party's centralization of economic control, she and the CCP have governed by ideology and made decisions that promote select she loyalists, undermine global interests and free market principles, distort trade relations, gut economic growth, and damage the well being not only of their own citizens, but ours. Xi's economic approach amounts to a Leninist revival and an assertion of state control and interventions that exceed past practice. In the past, we saw massive subsidies and support for inefficient state-owned enterprises. Now we see these interventions in the non-state sector with the inevitable outcome of crushing productivity and innovation. The plain evidence of this failure of state intervention is their semiconductor capabilities. Even with an estimated 150 billion in state funding, most of the fabrication capacity in China is generations behind us, and where they've managed to close the gap, production is at small scale. Xi's economic approach includes massive subsidies matched by punishing disciplinary in inspections. This year, we've seen financial regulators and institutions under attack in an effort to strengthen party leadership. While the campaign was intended, to redirect the economy to Xi's goal of higher quality growth and to rein in the shockingly high debt that now stands at over $51 trillion. It is in fact another effort of the party to, to strengthen its position through fear and intimidation. This investigation like others will not solve the economic problems it, it, because it is the party's ruinous practices that have led to the current economic crisis. Shadow banking, ad hoc and irrational government bailouts, creating market confusion, the explosion of local government financing vehicles who bought, whose bond buyers are other localities who are in similar weak positions, real estate speculation and collapse, and the continuation of massive subsidies to inefficient but politically loyal SOEs are the drivers of inefficiency, weakness, and weakening growth. And there is no evidence of change. The approach to COVID sums up what I see as Xi's central theme in general. He is using security tools of lockdowns, surveillance, arrests, and in-home incarceration, in short, the crowbars and hammers available to the state, to address economic and human concerns. Over the past two years, COVID practices have improved CC access to information and management of its citizens. The question presented by the protests is, can Xi sustain these policies? The answer in the short term may be yes. They can impose draconian measures to ensure the party's security at great human cost. But the problem is these policies failed in the Soviet Union and they will fail in China because it is one massive wobbly Ponzi scheme. Yes. Some foreign companies and investors seem to be reassessing their position. Between January and June of this year, foreign and offshore holdings of Chinese bonds fell at record levels. It was the largest drop in net outflows in hedge fund investments in 15 years, and direct investment has also declined. On the other hand, companies are considering new investments in China, including in their pension scheme. I think the commission is concerned that this so-called opportunity repeats past risky practice. China invites foreign participation only when it suits their national interest. So to address many of these economic challenges, posed by the China's protectionist and mercantilist approaches, um, we have set out two of our top recommendations in the economic area. We have a proposal that I expect we'll talk a little bit more about, Dennis, uh, suspending 
most favored nation trading status with China. And we've also encouraged the establishment of a new office of security preparedness and resilient economic resilience. And I think I'll stop with the two top recommendations and turn to Carolyn for a summary of the security and foreign affairs issues and recommendations in that area. Thank you. And thanks again, Dennis, for having us. Well, thank you, Robin, for that. Yes. Carolyn? Thank you very much, Dennis. And, and uh, interesting, as you talked about China's accession to the WTO, we have to acknowledge not only your service on the commission, but your service to the nation uh, as the ambassador to the WTO. Um, I look forward to hearing more insights about the inside story there. Um, as, as Robin mentioned, it, it's been a difficult year for China. It's, it's interesting because uh, this was supposed to be a glory year, the sort of the coronation of Xi Jinping. And it turns out, of course, that it hasn't been the stable year that I think that, that, that the, certainly that the Chinese Communist Party was expecting at the beginning of the year. Uh, COVID, as, as Robin mentioned, has been a huge factor. Um, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, the war against Ukraine, has certainly uh, been a problematic issue uh, for China. And um, there are just another, a number of other factors that, that have meant that the, the, the stability that they thought, that the Chinese Communist Party thought that they were entering 2022 with, actually has not turned out to be that way. Um, in response, Xi Jinping and, and his, and his uh, party officials around him um, have both cracked down internally, um, trying to shut down any, any dissent inside China. Robin mentioned the protests that have been taking place. That's unusual and something interesting to watch. And externally, what they, what they have been doing is, um, frankly, increasing their uh, aggressiveness and, and assertiveness in, in countries around the world, which is interesting. At the same time, of course, there's been so little uh, interaction or flow in or out of, of China of people going to China from other places or people in China leaving. Um, one of the challenges of doing an annual report is by the time we lock down the text, uh, which in this case, I think was October 6th, things start changing. And I just want to notice, and we can perhaps talk, talk about this more, that Xi Jinping is today uh, in Saudi Arabia and, and having a summit with um, the Gulf countries, um, which indicates really some interesting um, geopolitical dynamics, I think, that are taking place. So uh, in 2022, Russia and China announced a no limits partnership, which is a culmination of a years long effort to strengthen ties. This of course was immediately followed by Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Beijing has um, unfortunately provided diplomatic and economic support to Russia, all while at the same time promoting itself as objective and impartial. The CCP, diplomats, and media amplified Russian, uh, Russian talking points and has attempted to shift blame to the United States and NATO for Russia's war of choice. Since, since the invasion, um, Beijing has refused to condemn Russia, um, has amplified Russian disinformation and talking points, has continued economic support through oil and grain imports, and has ignored President Zelensky's requests to talk with, with Xi himself. This be behavior, interestingly, contradicts the Chinese government's public commitment to the principles of territorial integrity and non-interference and has indicated that China's worldview is more hierarchical where some countries' sovereignty and interests are clearly more important than others. Nevertheless, China's diplomats regularly describe their position as objective and impartial. It's been a year of hits and misses in foreign policy for, for, for China. China intensified its push for greater influence and access abroad with mixed results. Um, they have secured additional overseas access for their armed forces, solidifying the People's Liberation Army's presence at a Cambodian naval base, and they've signed an agreement with the Solomon Islands to grant access and transit rights to Chinese armed forces. Where they haven't done so well is that their aggressiveness and stance on Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has led to NATO calling out systemic challenges from China, the EU calling Chinese diplomats deaf to Europeans' concerns, the Quad, that is Australia, the US, Japan, and India, um, voicing concerns about illegal maritime claims and coercion, and Japan redoubling its economic and military security efforts. 
Uh, the CCP leaders have using and are using the aftermath of the invasion as an opportunity to promote Xi's new global security initiative, which is based on an idea of indivisible security that Putin used to justify his invasion of Ukraine. It aims to delegitimize the US-led architecture of alliances and sanctions to make the international security environment more favorable to China. It's still vague, this global security initiative, but it certainly needs monitoring, especially as China targets the global South and is including non-traditional security tools such as greater access for law enforcement abroad. Again, we've seen since our report went, went to, to press, um, the, the, pres the, the recognition of the presence of um, unofficial Chinese police stations operating in countries around the world, um, most of which are being used to monitor dissent um, by people outside of China, Chinese citizens outside of China, um, and to, to uh, frankly punish them or punish their families back home. Um, the heavy handedness that, that Beijing has been using it really is seeking to hide the fragility in the system that they have. I want to talk a little bit about um, Taiwan, of course. We focused, we had a hearing on Taiwan. Uh, we've seen, you can read it almost daily, China's increasing um, aggressiveness and coercion towards Taiwan. The aggressiveness, of course, we saw culminating when Speaker Pelosi went to uh, Taiwan in, in August. But the, the, the uh, CCP has been really targeting um, economic issues in Taiwan too, uh, where they are focusing on, um, um, it's not sanctions, but focusing on shutting down a small and politically important sectors of the Taiwan economy to have an impact on the decisions that are being made in Taiwan. Um, we have last year in our report determined that the Chinese uh, PLA has the capability of, of um, invading Taiwan, though we didn't uh, create any decision determination on whether they could actually do that successfully. It's not quite as easy a, a function as, uh, as some people have, have done. And I would just note that the Department of Defense's uh, new China military power report that has just come out has also basically come to the same conclusion. Um, we every year pick a region to focus on in, in our hearings. This year we did uh, Central and South Asia. Interestingly, on Central Asia, when we picked the topic, Russia had not invaded Ukraine. Um, I think that the invasion of Ukraine uh, has really changed the dynamic uh, for China, frankly, in Central Asia and has increased the importance of US participation uh, working with Central Asian countries. Um, in South Asia, we know that the, that the Chinese are trying to split uh, the Indians from Indian uh, allied countries in, in the region. And of course, China's close relationship with Pakistan makes, that, makes their um, actions towards India, including um, conflict on the, the border the, between India and China, it, it, uh, it, it makes it all a little bit more tense. So what we see is, is um, really China's increasing participation in countries around the world, its dissemination of its own model of economic growth with authoritarianism, which is unfortunately seeing some success uh, in some, some countries, particularly in the global South. Um, but this is a trend that I think that we're gonna really need to, to deal with and to focus on as we move forward, both in the commission and in the country for our national policies. Well, th thank you very much, Carolyn, and thank you, Robin, again. I mean, this is the, the breadth of material that you've covered is, is uh, pretty astonishing. So uh, it's hard to sort of figure out what to, to, to focus on. But let's just talk about the commission itself a little bit and about congressional sentiment. It used to be said that uh, the Republicans on the commission were national security hawks who were primarily concerned about the military balance between the U.S. and the PRC. And the, the commission Democrats were primarily concerned about the U.S.-China trade deficit and the hollowing out of manufacturing capacity in the United States. But it seems that over time, uh, there's been a convergence of concern uh, which, but between Republicans and Democrats, which is also reflected in congressional sentiment. I was wondering if you, you'd comment on that observation. Yes. Uh, shall I start with that one, Robin? <laughs> Having served on the commission just a few years more, uh, more than you, uh, mm -hmm. certainly much longer than I ever expected it would take the place. Yeah, it's been an interesting thing to see. Um, I would say that in the early years, the, de the Democrats particularly mm -hmm. 
really uh, focused on the idea that economic security is national security and that the two are really intertwined. And as you said, um, the Republicans generally in the early years really had been focused on traditional definitions of national security. That has shifted. Um, I, I think that's because people have recognized what China's unfair trade practices have done to, uh, to weaken our own economy. And we need a strong economy in order to have national security. I also think that as there's been more focus on technology, there's really been an overlap on the issues, both about our economic future, you know, our, our, our tech, the tech world is, our, is the future of our economy, but also the national security implications of technology. When we talk about surveillance, when we talk about intellectual property theft, when we talk about uh, uh, just data and the protection of data and the dissemination of data, all of those things have both economic consequences and national security consequences. One more observation before I turn it over to Robin. In the early years of this commission, we were considered outliers in the debate. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you asked about how Congress has changed things, but we were really considered outliers in the debate and we aren't outliers anymore. And that's not because our views have changed, it's because the whole debate has shifted towards more of a recognition of the challenges. And in fact, sometimes the threats that the rise of China's Communist Party poses to the United States, to our economic and our national security. Robin? I don't think that I can add anything to that other than, other than to say that the convergence is evident in the fact that the commission report is annually a consensus document. Um, and I, we've been, what, 21 reports and virtually I think all of them have been uh, uh, agreed to by everybody. So I think that reflects the, the there may have been parallel interests that have converged. And what's most important is that there's a consensus. And Dennis, you know that when we release the report, we also go through a series of briefings and meetings on Capitol Hill. The, the, yeah. the Hill is really our client uh, for all of this, uh, all of this work. And what's also been interesting to see over the course of the past couple of years is how many of those briefings have really moved from staff level briefings to members themselves actually wanting to be briefed. There is significant interest in 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 the in the Hill in the Congress about uh, US-China issues and, okay. and what we can do to improve things going forward. Well, I know the House Republicans have announced uh, an intention to create a select committee on China. So I just hope they uh, tap into the good work uh, of the China Commission over the past uh, 22 years, your resource that should be uh, utilized. Let me just, Robin, you, you sort of mentioned, um, you did mention uh, Xi Jinping's uh, accession to the general secretary position for uh, the third consecutive or third uh, five-year term, which is generally <laughs> unprecedented and sort of makes him the, the, the most powerful ruler of China uh, since Mao. And what, what do you, I, the, re, the commission's report goes into this a little bit. I'd love to, for you to dive a little bit more deeply into it. And Carolyn, please add on as well. But what does this further centralization of power uh, in a single person uh, portend for China's uh, future policies and U.S.-China relations? Well, I think it reflects a reduction in the consensus building process that has historically characterized Chinese decision making. It's um, a reduction in any challenge to Xi's ideas and authority. And in reducing the consensus building and any challenge to his authority, I think we're increasing the possibility of risk and miscalculation. Um, I think Carolyn can talk a little bit more. It was a hearing I think she co-chaired on on sort of the process of of uh, of this centralization of authority under Xi. But um, he is he has restructured the policy making system to accommodate his and his views alone, and he's removed uh, any challenge to that authority. So. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that nobody within the senior leadership of the Politburo has ever led, managed, or or been responsible for major innovation in, in China. They are all staff officials. We love staff, but running China, uh, uh, it presents significant risk in terms of, of an echo chamber where he alone has uh, authority and decision making. So. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. The echo chamber um, is is a is a concerning factor, actually, and and um, where the U.S. government, our diplomatic corps, does not have access to 
um, some of the people around Xi Jinping, it makes it more difficult for us to understand what it is they're doing, how they're making their decisions. Um, but also the, the fact that he has surrounded himself with, with a, a small core of people whose loyalty to him has been the real test. Robin mentioned them, the problem of the fact that these people don't have experience to, to manage or run the kinds of programs that, that, that they're being in charge of. But it also limits any sort of flexibility or ability to correct any policy mistakes. It's been interesting. Again, I, I keep thinking, of course, about uh, Russia's Russia's war uh, on Ukraine um, and the lessons that that we learn from all of this. And I think that structurally, um, Xi Jinping is is going to have some of the same problems that Putin did, which is that they surround themselves with yes men. Uh, Xi Jinping has now basically got a solidified control over military and any of the military uh, policy and decision making. And the question is, will there be anybody around him who either is willing or able to actually say to him what is taking place on the ground? Because we think that certainly with Putin, he's surrounded by yes men and he isn't necessarily aware of just what is taking place and, and frankly, how poorly the, the Russians are doing. Thank you for war. that, Carolyn. I mean, I've heard that too. Uh, I remember having a conversation with a Western uh, ambassador to to Beijing uh, who had just left, and uh, he was emphasizing the point that people around Xi are afraid to tell him the truth or to to, to give him a, a you know an accurate assessment of what's going on uh, on the ground uh, for fear of blowback. But I mean, we in recent last week uh, was, we saw these amazing protests uh, across the country in China. Uh, against the zero COVID uh, policy of mandatory uh, lockdowns and quarantines and testing. Uh, saw today in the paper that the state council has uh, decided to uh, waive some of that or it inject some flexibility to these policies. Just uh, what, what's your thought? I would be remiss not asking you this question. I mean, what are your thoughts about what happened last week? Is this a sign that uh, there may be some meaningful challenge to CCP control in China? Does it, does this, the lot they're showing some flexibility now demonstrate weakness by Xi to his elite uh, colleagues in, in the Politburo and elsewhere? Just, just your thoughts. Uh, I'd love to hear them on this. So I think that, that, um, that the response by the Chinese people was really um, amazing last, last, uh, last week. Uh, it's, it is interesting that the CCP, which has decided to ease some of the zero COVID policies in some places, has been careful to say that it wasn't in response to what was mm -hmm. happening with the protests, but it was done because the facts on the ground have changed. And they're saying that Omicron is not as deadly as it was before. Of course, we, we have to see how this all unfolds. There are some estimates that the Chinese uh, people we could, we could be dying at 50,000 a day if, if COVID takes off because they haven't done a very good job of vaccination campaigns or anything like that. But what was extraordinary about last week is that it happened in so many places simultaneously um, in a context where the Chinese government has such close control over information, so much surveillance, that it's not as though people could organize across different cities, either within the city or from city to city, a community to community in order to coordinate what was happening. To me, what was also interesting is that the, is that the demands in some places went well beyond um, uh, re, um, re reducing COVID restrictions. They, they, people, some people were calling for Xi Jinping to step down. People were calling for more freedom. They were calling for more freedom of the press, um, more, more ability to, to determine their own futures. And to me, that was really important because it demonstrates, right, that the Chinese people still want freedoms. They, 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 they want to have a more open life. They want to know what's going on in their own country and in the world. And they're, and they're bravely speaking out for those things because none of these protests happen without consequences for the people who are protesting. People are now having their, on the street, they're having their cell phones searched. They, you know, the, the, um, the Chinese government is looking for any evidence that people participated in the protests or supported them. Whether it's a real threat to the, to the CCP, I, I think that remains to be seen, but frankly, I'm, I'm not as hopeful as, as I would like to be on that topic. Robin? Rob, Robin? Um, I agree with everything that Carolyn has said and, and including the um, uh, less than optimistic um, uh, hopes about whether or not this this will bring about a material shift in, in Xi's approach. I think um, what's been fascinating is the ability to communicate notwithstanding the surveillance, the, the white sheets of paper that have been 
held up to object to censorship. Um, it, it's just remarkable that, that, that aspirations turn into these kinds of actions. And I, and I would also say that, you know, I think it's, it's fascinating that, that moments after uh, the crowning of, of a new emperor by his cronies, the people have pointed out that he has no clothes. Now, whether or not that that's that's sustainable in the in the public domain, I don't know. We I don't know, but I think it's noteworthy that it came so soon after uh, uh, she's she's crowning, as it were. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to, Dennis, can I add sure. one thing to what Robin said because she pointed out the the creativity of people in protesting by holding up the blank sheets of paper. One of my favorite uh, things that people did is that there were a group of math graduate students who held up a mathematical equation called the Friedman uh, equation because it translates to free men. And it's just <laughs> an example of the absolute creativity that could be unleashed um, uh, for the Chinese people if the restrictions on their ability to think, to speak, to organize, to, to, to worship were lifted. I, I totally agree. Um, well, let me just get to the economics uh, question. Robin, uh, you mentioned that your top recommendation this year for the commission is that Congress consider legislation to immediately suspend China's permanent normal trade relations treatment after a 90 day review by the administration. And for me, that's a that's a big deal. It's basically saying that the that the experiment, uh, that the idea that bringing China into the, into the international trading system on equal terms with market economies uh, would lead to a further opening up to China, up, opening up in China and to even political uh, liberalization, which was the theory at the time, but that has failed. Uh, is, is that your assessment? And uh, why did the commission decide to look at this particular issue at this particular moment in time? Oops. I can't hear you. There you go. Um, I think it, yes, I think it is the consensus uh, recommendation. You know, 20 years ago when the Clinton administration negotiated a deal, um, many of us hoped that China would comply with both their bilateral and multilateral um, obligations that were to facilitate accession to the WTO. Um, they've been a member for 20 plus years. They've enjoyed considerable trading benefits and they failed to honor their obligations. So I think in the aftermath of COVID and the fail failure to address phase one trade agreements and the continued recognition that some of something you pointed out, Dennis, that the dispute resolution system at the WTO is hopelessly broken um, and, and taking into consideration the rising concerns about our economic inter interdependence with an authoritarian regime, the commission decided it was time to reassess. And so we have, it wasn't just that we recommended legislation to suspend PNTR, we rec recommended a whole of government approach where USTR would put together a checklist of the 20 plus obligations that the Chinese undertook and then present it to Congress. And these are simple, simple obligations like opening up the Beijing Shanghai corridor to, tele to foreign telecommunications companies. Have they done it or not? We don't need a complicated narrative. We just need a checklist. And then once that checklist is presented, I think the Hill should take up legislation. Um, I think we agreed that it's time to consider whether we should suspend all or some of the um, of the benefits that that have have been provided to China. And um, and I think one of the things that you pointed out, Dennis, in the past is even where markets have opened up for our companies, they open up only when Chinese companies have consolidated their position and crowded out foreign entities. So we're faced with an untenable situation. I think you called it Alice in Wonderland in a speech. Yeah, I did. <laughs> we're, um, we're up is down and black is white. And I think, as I said, after COVID, after uh, recognition of the, the, the fragility of some of our supply chains, the failure to follow through on the trade, uh, the phase one trade deal. I think the commission decided that the time had come to, 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 to look at this fundamental um, uh, uh, agreement that that um, has shaped the trade and economic relationship for 20 years. 
This is this is an area I think where um, uh, it's been interesting to see an alignment of, of views within the commissioners themselves. You know, we have had different views. Some of us, for example, were skeptical at the very beginning that that all of the promises that were made uh, to members of Congress and to the American people about what bringing China into the WTO would would accomplish. Um, uh, Dennis, you you can speak to this better than I can, which is of course the the presumption at the time was that um, the WTO, uh, China's accession to the WTO would change China's practices. Instead, many of us were concerned that it is China's presence that has changed the WTO itself and not to the benefit of countries that are not China. So it's, it has been an interesting alignment of views at the commission that have ended up in this, in this recommendation this year. Well, great. I mean, you have one recommendation or one finding uh, that I'm quoting the commission report, years of paralysis and inadequate rules on non-market economic actors have shown that the WTO cannot adequately address challenges stemming from China's practices. And that I have to tell you, landed on the truth there. The WTO is incapable of shaping or restraining these non-market practices. Uh, Let's go to Hong Kong and, and Taiwan. I mean, you mentioned Taiwan. I, Carol, uh, I know you've been a strong supporter of the democratic movement in Hong Kong. Uh, Robin, your former boss, Senator McConnell, was the author of the Hong Kong Policy Act. Why should Americans care about what has happened in Hong Kong over the past year? And why should Americans care about the status of Taiwan? Robin, you want to start with that one? I'll start with Hong Kong, and then uh, um, I think I think why we should care because American citizens um, are being targeted, American journalists are being targeted. Um, the very principle or the premise for Hong Kong, which was freedom of speech, freedom of education, um, and the rule of law, have been compromised and erased. Um, I thought it was noteworthy that recently um, the a, a court surprisingly agreed that Jimmy Lai should be allowed to have an attorney defend him. Um, a remarkable moment that that lasted all of thirty seconds because then his attorney's visa was denied. So I think uh, a city that was the a, a an economic and commercial center. Uh, for American and global businesses um, has become just another Chinese city subject to the same kind of, of um, manip manip manipulative and dangerous policies that um, compromise free markets and, and open trade. As a result of that, we recommended well, that there are two key recommendations that that uh, on Hong Kong. We think that since Hong Kong's become just another Chinese city, we should close the two the several Hong Kong economic offices, and they should be merged with the Chinese uh, mission. And then we also recommend um, uh, sustaining the visas, extending the visas for those who have fled Hong Kong's system. So adding on, on Hong Kong, um, one of the reasons that, that uh, Americans should care about what's happening in Kong, Hong Kong is that it has been a global financial center, that, uh, that, that reputation of which has been based on um, rule of law and, and basic freedoms. And certainly the rule of law, the, 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 the recent rulings by Hong Kong's judicial system have demonstrated that, that the rule of law no longer exists in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Robin mentioned Jimmy Lai's case, uh, you know, that they, he was granted the ability to have um, a, a British um, person representing him. And while the Hong Kong court system um, said that that was okay, what happened was they ended up uh, not giving this guy a visa. So, so it was a different part of the Hong Kong government that just uh, prevented him from, from participating. And they've also appealed to Beijing to get involved in this. So, you know, it's it, for, for all of the American businesses, the foreign businesses that still see uh, Hong Kong as a financial center, they need to be really concerned about what's happening with the rule of law there. It is, it is, it is not what it was before. On Taiwan, there are a number of reasons why people in this country should care about what's happening in Taiwan. One uh, is Taiwan has an important um, uh, physical uh, presence, right? That, 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 it, that it's in the island chain 
that helps provide some sort of um, buffer or protection um, against what China's actions might, might become. So that's important. It's an important economic relationship for us too. We have, you know, they're, they're, they're an important, um, uh, they have important companies that work that that do creative and innovative uh, both design and manufacturing of semiconductors and ensuring that 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 industry continues to survive in a democratic system is a really important thing and it's a it's a burgeoning democracy i mean it, uh, china has not been demo, uh, taiwan has not been democratic for very many years uh, 30 i think maybe we're talking about 35 and the fact that it has been so enormously successful is really a good example of again what happens when you unleash the potential of people and 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 they have basic freedoms to create to develop to design to to speak their minds it's a robust civil society that the taiwan has and it can serve as a model for other countries in asia also there's a lot of expertise in taiwan from which we could all benefit um, they've done a phenomenal job in dealing with, with the COVID pandemic, and um, the, the Chinese government has refused to allow Taiwan to share the lessons that it, has, that it has learned and its success on these things with other countries, which has an impact on public health around the world. So there are a number of reasons. Well, great. Uh, thank you. Let me, what was, uh, I know the commission does a lot of fact-finding uh, and research during the course of the year, public hearings. What was the most surprising thing you learned uh, this year that you can say in a non unclassified uh, setting <laughs> like this webinar? Robin, you Anything want to start on that mind? one? Uh, no, Carolyn, I think that <laughs> <laughs> I would I I think that that it was actually Carolyn's hearing uh, on the consolidation of of she's authority that that I, I think I don't know whether it's a false hope springs eternal, but but I kept thinking there would be um, factions or individuals or some process that would put a check on his his absolute authority. And I and so I think that was that that singular development was probably the most um, surprising to me that that there was no relenting, there was no shift, there was no adjustment. Um, it was full steam ahead. And while Carolyn talks, I might think of another one. <laughs> okay, Carolyn? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I guess the, what is the surprise? You know, what we really documented is a continuation of concerns <laughs> that we have had over a number of years. I would say, although it's not necessarily a surprise, um, again, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has really crystallized um, in the world that we are sort of in a in a in a battle in a competition between authoritarianism and democracy, and so I think that that uh, the alignment of parties uh, of countries in that kind of competition it's it's not a surprise but it's a clarification really of some of us have raised concerns about what China's practices have been in standard setting bodies in dissemination of information and in media and in cyber all of these areas but it's really been crystallized this year with with Russia's uh, unprovoked um, war ag against Ukraine mm -hmm. well we have one last question which I will ask uh, you know in the report uh, you state there remains a gap between America's growing recognition of the challenges China presents and our responses to date in dealing with them. Um, why do you think this gap exists? And where do you see the US-China relationship heading over the next few years? Robin? <laughs> Small question. <laughs> I, I think, um, well, the gap is closing as we've talked over this hour. Um, I think it has existed because there've been competing interests. I think businesses for a long time thought there was opportunity in China. Students certainly flocked there to learn language and learn culture. Um, I think that, that the, the gap has clo is closing because there is a recognition that there is not fair consideration of all interests, whether it's commercial or, or, or personal freedoms. Um, and then the, the second part of the question was, and what next? Um, yeah, what's next? Um, I think, you know, I think a good example of what's next, what the Biden administration just did in, in, uh, on chips, I think we're going to see an increasingly um, systematic, I hope, 
whole of government approach to compete with China, that there will be a an alignment of strategy between commerce and treasury. And one of our recommendations was if there are sanctions imposed by one agency, they ought to be adopted by all agencies. And uh, we have had kind of a piecemeal approach that has not served our interests. So I think we will see um, a more uh, thoughtful, systematic, and hopefully um, assertive uh, policy that, that serves American interests. Yeah, I would agree with what Robin has said and, and um, you know, would just say that I think going back to probably about 2007, the commission actually started calling for we needed we needed basically an architecture uh, within this country for US China policy. And I know that there have been some more calls for sort of a strategic vision, a strategic architecture, but there are so many competing interests. There's human rights, there's business, there's there's technology, there's there's values, there's all of these issues, and and um, govern, uh, governments, administrations have had a tendency to sort of pick off one or the other, or go one way or another, and so the whole of government approach really needs to be implemented because we also know that the Chinese government does that in its different places around the world. It calls on different pieces of its government in order to accomplish what its aims are. So we really we really need to make sure that we have that. Well, this has been a terrific uh, conversation. I want to thank you both, Carolyn Bartholomew, Robin Cleveland, for sharing your expertise and the insights and recommendations of the uh, U.S.-China Economic and Security Re uh, Commission report. And uh, I wish you hope to see you soon in person, not virtually. Uh, and I want to thank our, our virtual audience uh, for joining us today and uh, wishing everyone a very uh, wonderful holiday season. Take care. Thank you. Thank Dennis. you, Dennis. Thanks. Thanks.